<laughs> okay, we start now with this talk about the question why did Ettore Majorana invent the Majorana neutrino and is it really Majorana, the neutrino? You see, the situation in 1930 about the beta decay was mentioned by the previous speaker. The problem is there is a nucleus with a charge Z, today we will say Z protons, was not so clear at that time, and the final nucleus has Z plus one protons, and the total energy of this transition should be given to the emitted electron. So the electron should have, perhaps I can use this, so the electron should have when you plot it as a function of the electron energy, a uh, discrete line here. But in reality, the problem was that it was a continuum. Niels Bohr was already prepared to give up energy convention at conservation uh, at that time on the nuclear level, which was a, a disastrous assumption. But then came Also, no discrete line, a continuum, and then came Wolfgang Pauli with his famous letter, which he wrote on the 4th of December 1930 from Zürich, where he was professor to Tübingen, my university, where there was a little meeting about radioactivity. It started with sehr geehrte radioaktive Damen und Herren, or in English here, radioactive ladies and gentlemen, and his solution out of the problem was that there is an additional particle, uh, he called it neutron at that time, because the neutron from Chadwick was not yet detected. Neutrino is a name which was given to this particle by Enrico Fermi. You see, he said there is a, another particle, the neutrino emitted, and it takes all the energy. So together, the electron energy, which is this continuum, plus the neutrino energy, is this energy which uh, goes from the nuclear set to the nuclear set plus one. But he also said in his letter that he, it will not be measured because it has practically no interaction with the surrounding. But in that, in that statement, he was wrong. You see, the neutrino was measured by Reines and Cohen in 1956. In 1995, I had Reines invited to the Erich School on Nuclear Physics. A month later, he got the Nobel Prize. Cohen was already dead, so Cohen did not get the Nobel Prize, but Linus got it, and Linus told me he met Cohen on the airport in Chicago. They had a two-hour uh, shift of airplanes, and they decided with a cup of coffee to do something important to detect the neutrino. And indeed, they succeeded detecting it. To decide to detect the neutrino is easy, but then to detect it, that is a little bit more difficult. So he detected the neutrino together with Cohen, but then Steinberger, six years later, detected an other neutrino called Muon neutrino, and the Donut collaboration in the year 2000 detected a third neutrino, the Tau neutrino. So we have today three neutrinos in the three families. You see, and starting from 1995 on, we saw that neutrinos are changing their flavor from electron to muon to tau on and back again, and that is only possible if the neutrinos have a mass. First, the assumption was the neutrino is massless, but the oscillations can only be explained if the neutrino has a mass. As soon as the neutrino has a mass, the helicity of the neutrino is not anymore a good quantum number. You see, the, the neutrino is left-handed. If it runs in this direction, the speed is opposite that is not left-handed. If the anti-neutrino, if the anti-neutrino runs in this direction, the spin is parallel, so we call it right-handed. 
But if the neutrino has a mass, you can always go in a reference frame which moves faster than the neutrino because the neutrino runs less than light velocity and in that new reference frame the helicity changes. So the helicity is not a good quantum number. That is not afterwards very important for uh, deciding if the neutrino is Majorana or if it is Stira. So then, you see, Eto de Majorana came back in August 1933 from the state in Leipzig, in, from Heisenberg. We did hear about that in detail. And uh, he lived very secluded up to 37 in an in a, uh, apartment of the Majorana family in Rome. But then came in 1937, there came three new chairs, chairs and uh, Enrico Fermi called their chairs for the New Testament. The New Testament was in his language uh, quantum mechanics. So the, there were chairs for quantum mechanics. And here you see Giancarlo Vick got the chair in Palermo and then moved to Torino. Uh, Giulio Raca in Pisa moved in 39 to Israel, and Giovanni Gentile, there we have some discussions with Erasmo Recami, uh, let's say he moved in, at least he moved immediately to Milan. I met John Carlo Wick in the 80s, I gave a talk in Torino before lunch, and then he came to me after the talk and said, come to my room after lunch and tell me what is new in physics. I was very surprised that such a famous man like Giancarlo Wick, I had used the Wick's theory very extensively in my work, asked me to tell him what is new about physics. And I met also Raka, Junior Raka, in my first international conference, that was in 1964, at the Max Planck Institute of Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. Raka was the summary speaker of that conference, and after my talk, he came to me and asked me some question for the summary. And he mentioned me in the summary. And I was very flattered. I was a young scientist of 26 years old that a famous Raga, of whom I had used the Raga coefficients also extensively, was mentioning me in his summary talk. Giovanni Gentile died already early in 1942. You know that his father was professor of philosophy and also minister of Mussolini, and the family is from Sicily, from Castel Viperano. And that may be important because when this was known to Ettore Majorana, he finally applied for a chair of this tree. But the Enrico Fermi committee had already given away all three chairs. So there was no place anymore for Edgar and Majorana. But due to Giovanni Gentili, the older one, Enrico Fermi had such a big influence that he got a fourth chair in Naples. And that fourth chair went then to Edgar and Majorana. And for the competition for that fourth chair, he had to write a paper. And that is the very famous paper of Ettore Majorana, Le, La Theo, Theorica Symmetrica del Electrone e del Positrone. He discusses not only the electron and the positron as particle and antiparticle, but the important point in this paper is that he shows that there are two possible solutions for the neutrino from the Dirac equation. One is that the neutrino and the anti-neutrino are different particles, then they would be Dirac particles, or they are the same particles, then we speak of Majorana neutrino. And the question naturally is today, is the neutrino really Majorana, or is it Dirac? You see, this is the lecture note of uh, Ettore Majorana, this was given to me by uh, Aldo Covello from Naples. Later on I learned that Erasmo de Carmi had published this lecture notes, but I, I did not know about that. And, uh, 
either available to me that he copied it from the original. Okay, that's the statement he made to me. And on the 26th of March, we did learn from Erasmo that he disappeared on the mail ship from Naples to Palermo and perhaps back again to Naples. And we don't know about that. Now the question is, can we prove experimentally if the neutrino is Majorana or if it's the light? It does not work in a single beta decay where a neutron changes in a proton, you emit an electron and you emit an anti-neutrino with positive helicity spin in flight direction. That happens for Dirac neutrinos and Majorana neutrinos. Also the, the two neutrino double beta decay, which was treated in the thesis of Maria Göbert Meyer in 1935 in Göttingen. <coughs> you know, Maria Göbert Meyer later on got with Jensen the Nobel Prize for the nuclear shell model, but that was long before that time. And also here, you see, you have enough energy, for example, in germanium 76, and when you change to selenium 76, you have two beta decays, and in each beta decay you have this situation, and you, this is not different for Dirac neutrinos and or Majorana neutrinos. The experimental process for Dirac neutrinos, <coughs> I don't know why I did it wrong, is the neutrino that's double beta decay. You see, we have between germanium and selenium 76 an energy difference of 2038 keV. Enough to have two beta decays. Here the electron is emitted, and here an anti neutrino with positive helicity spin in flight direction is emitted. Over here we absorb a neutrino, and it must be now a neutrino. The anti neutrino is equal to the neutrino if it is a Majorana neutrino. <coughs> able to absorb the neutrino here, the anti-neutrino here as a neutrino, as a Majorana neutrino. But there is a problem, you see, because the weak interaction is left-handed. You see, this has a positive helicity, the anti-neutrino, and the neutrino has a negative helicity. But we learned already when the neutrino has a mass, helicity is not a good quantum number. So due to the mass of the neutrino, this is possible. So this is only possible that the neutrino does double beta decay for massive Majorana neutrinos. You have to have a Majorana neutrino to have this decay and the neutrino has to be massive and we know it is massive due to the neutrino oscillations. The question is, is the neutrino Majorana or is it Dirac? And the experimental routing is this neutrino less double beta decay. Let me show you two results of the neutrino less double beta decay, the newest result. This is the Gerda collaboration. This is essentially a German collaboration from Heidelberg, München, and from my university in Tübingen. Here is plotted the energy of the two ele electrons which are emitted. You see the neutrino that's double beta decay. All the energy goes to the two electrons. And if you sum the energy of the two electrons, you should get the Q value. And the Q value is 2038 keV here. So at 2038 keV, that is here, you should have a peak. But you don't see a peak. So at the moment, we do not have a proof that the neutrino is Majorana. It could be Majorana, when we could say the experiment is not sensitive enough, but it's already a tremendous experiment in the Hans Hassel. Let's have a look to an, uh, an experiment from the Milano group that is uh, also in the Kansasso, where is the Milano group, Sapienza and Zaragoza are involved. The Q value is here 2528 keV from tellurium 130 to xenon 130. 
and the 200, 2528 is here. Here is the sum of the two electron energies. You see, and for the neutrino, this double beta decay, the two electrons get the full energy, and you should have a peak here. This is not a peak, that is a peak from a contamination, from cobalt. One also does not see here the peak. So at the moment, the situation is still open. We do not know if the neutrino is Majorana or the neutrino is Dira. It could be Majorana, and we are not yet sensitive enough in these experiments. So one has to reduce the background, and perhaps we will be happy. It's obvious that the first one who makes this group might get the Nobel Prize. So many groups in the world are racing now to find a Majorana neutrino in the neutrinoless double beta decay. Now we have already heard that in the last 10 years there were exciting news that there are maybe Majorana fermions, now not neutrinos, Majorana fermion, which are their own antiparticles, that means Majorana fermions in solid state physics, and that these Majorana fermions may have something to say for uh, quantum computing. You see, let's, there is an article which I recommend to read for those who are interested in reviews of modern physics, which discusses this problem in detail. Let's take a superconductor. You see, in the superconductor, when there is no interaction between <coughs> the electrons, they move free in this solid, then you have a sharp Fermi surface. We plot here the electron energy and all the states below uh, the specific energy, and that is called the Fermi <coughs> energy. You see, all the states are occupied with probability 1, and the states above are empty. As soon as you switch on the interaction in solids in superconductivity, this is the interaction with electrons running in opposite direction with excite the same crystal vibration, the same lattice vibrations, and you get a smeared out Fermi surface. So the state here is partially occupied and partially empty. And these quantities which describe the occupation probability is V squared. The amplitude is V, and V squared is the probability that this state is, is occupied and that the state is empty, is u squared, and actually always the sum of v squared plus u squared must be 1 in uh, solid state, in, so in superconducting solids. Now, next. Now I can then back to that was one. You see, you can now ask excitations here. When you want to make an excitation here, you see at that point, the V squared, the probability that the state is occupied, and the probability that the state is empty, is one half. Just one half at the Fermi surface here. And when you now, you see, and you have, in solid state physics, you have a tremendous amount of states, 10 to 28 states. So you have also many states at the Fermi surface. Don't think that there is only one state, there are many states near the Fermi surface in, in the lens which shows, solids, which shows superconductivity. Now when you want to make an excitation, let's say here, then you can excite a particle with the probability that this is empty. You have to take into account the Pauli principle. Or when you make a hole, then the, uh, the probability goes in that the state is occupied to remove a particle. So an excitation here is the amplitude for being empty, u squared is the probability for being empty, and you can create a particle with this probability u squared that the state is empty, and you can create an excitation with v squared probability that the state is occupied 
by making a hole. So you make a particle and the hole with different weights. Now if you are at the Fermi surface and the V squared and the U squared is just one half, so the U V squared and the U somehow the battery goes out. So somehow so somehow when you look here to the U C K minus and the V squared is equal to the U squared, this two expressions are equal, and these two expressions are equal, so the particle excitation is equal to the anti quasi particle excitation. That's my Johann. The particle at the Fermi surface in the superconductor is identical with its anti particle. It is not a neutrino, but it is a quasi particle excitation of a superposition of a particle and a hole in a superconductor. Yeah. You see, so we have quasi particle and quasi hole are identical, and that is what we call a Majorana fermion. No, no. Now what happens when you exchange, uh, let's say, a boson? Bosons are spin integer particles like ions or photons. Nothing changes when you interchange the two, but when you interchange again, you are back again. When you have fermions in one half particles like electrons, protons, or neutrons, you get a minus sign. When you change again, you go back here. But when you have Majorana fermions in this uh, so the superconducting solid state, then you get a phase. You are not only exchanging, but you get a phase IE to the power of I phi, and we call that the winding number. When you exchange a second time, you get the sec uh, second time the phase, and you have winding number two. And this winding number is a chiral symmetry, and it's a good quantum number if the excitation has the energy zero. But naturally that excitation has not exactly the energy zero, but it is close to zero, and therefore this winding number is close to a conserved quantity, but it's not exactly a conserved quantity. But the mathematical name is a non abelian anion. Let's forget it. Now we can use that winding number for a qubit. You see the qubit? You need always for a quantum, for a computer, you need a one and a zero, one and zero. The normal quantum computer works with spin up in some molecule or spin down, one and zero. Here we would say we take for the quantum number for zero, <coughs> we take zero quantum uh, winding number, and for the one we say we take winding number one. And due to this chiral symmetry, almost chiral symmetry, not complete, the life is quite longer. You see the problem in the quantum computer that the spin up does not live long due to the interaction with the surroundings. Or spin down also does not live long. But if it's protected by chiral symmetry, it lives longer. That is, it does not live forever because it has not, it is not the exact chiral symmetry, it's an approximate chiral symmetry, but it is living longer. And now, you see a qubit is now a superposition of zero and one. Of one winding number zero and winding number one. The, the alpha squared plus beta squared is always one. And when you now do a calculate in a quantum computer, you represent all numbers in powers of two. You see, Q1 can be 0 or 1, Q2 is 2 or 0, Q3 is 4 and 0, Q4 is 8 and 0, and so on. This is uh, 32 and 0. So, all together you can represent by this binomial quantities all numbers between 0 and 63. And they are all in there because, you see, in quantum mechanics, 
each of these states is not a zero or a one, but it's a superposition of zero and one. And if you now multiply such a number with another number, which also contains all the numbers between zero and 63, you have a, a tremendous capital computer. You immediately get the whole multiplication table of all numbers from zero to 63 times all numbers of zero to 63. That is the advantage of the quantum computer, that you do a tremendous amount of parallel calculations. Now, let me summarize. You see, the Dirac neutrino is different from the anti neutrino. The Majorana neutrino is identical with the anti neutrino. You see, we know from the neutrino oscillation that the neutrino has a mass, and therefore the chiral symmetry is not a good quantum number. But most extensions of the standard model say the neutrino should be a Majorana neutrino, but we do not know it. At present, it is so that the neutrino is double beta decay is the experimental process, but it is not conclusive yet. We do not know if the neutrino is Majorana or the neutrino is Dira. But improving the neutrino that is double beta decay, we might either find it a peak at the two at the Q value or find no peak. If we find a peak, we have proved that the neutrino is Majorana. If we find no peak, it's not conclusive. We say we must measure better. So <laughs> you can measure forever. If it is Dirac, you can measure forever. And you never will find the peak there. But you always can say you should measure better. And then I discussed Majorana fermions in superconducting solids. And Majorana fermions in superconducting solids have the binding number of topological symmetry, which is not exactly a good quantum number, but is a much better symmetry than just spin up and spin down. And that would yield more stable qubits, and by that we could easier perform quantum 